In the last lesson, we learned about the structure of the commodity system. We learned how it's designed to increase production and drive down prices. And you might ask, so what's wrong with that? In this section, we'll look at some of the problems that are associated with the system. The commodity system is important because most of the food, most of the agricultural products indeed, in this country are, go through the commodity system. We think local food is a big deal, and it is in some parts of the country, but it's small relative to the power of the commodity system. We learned that the structure of the system itself is designed to increase total production and drive down prices. We can see that as commodity supply increases, prices generally decrease. Profits per producer decreases, and pressure to produce production increases. This drives the system to create bigger, bigger size and more technology per producer, larger farms, larger fishing boats, increasing capacity, increasing total production. As total production increases, profit tends to go in the same direction, which provides more investment to increase capacity once again, and around and around we go, driving the system to increase production and drive down prices. Inside the circle, you'll see an abbreviated form of the structure of the commodity system, the increased demand, increase in profits, <clears throat> and increase in efficiency and scale. Outside of the circle, you see what we're calling three unintended consequences, or traps. These three commodity system traps are the resource depletion trap, the environmental pollution trap, and the com community decline trap. There's one more, which we'll learn about later. Here we begin to look at the resource depletion trap. All production systems depend on some kind of a resource. For coal mining, it's the coal underground. For lumber, it's the trees in the forest. For food and farming, it may be soil and water. You can see from this system, as you increase in capacity, you generally increase the harvest rate, moves in the same direction. As you increase the harvest rate, the resource level, whether that be soil, water, air, clean air, uh, or fish in the sea, will decline. More production means more profits. More profits mean more boats. More boats mean more fishing. And more fishing means less fish. Have you ever heard of the Ogallala Aquifer? This is an underground water source. It's been there for eons. It's a geological water source and doesn't get replenished in human time. It runs from South Dakota to North Texas. And farming in the Midwest, particularly in this region, Will depend on this depends on this water source, corn, soy, um, grain, other grains for cattle, all depend on a cheap source of water, and that source of water is drying up. So let's now use our system dynamics model to understand what's happening here. As capacity increases, look at the arrow that goes straight down to harvest rate, it moves in the same direction, right? As capacity increases, harvest rate increases. As harvest rate increases, the resource level decreases. If you use fish as an example, capacity of fishing goes up, more fish come out of the ocean, and more fish that come out of the ocean means the fisheries are, are left without with fewer fish. As this resource level goes down, however, the cost of acquiring the resource should go up. The problem is it takes a while to happen, and people don't notice it. The dotted line indicates there's a delayed signal in the system. You don't see it right away. But the cost of acquiring the fish will go up, and that will then drive the capacity down. This is a feedback loop that, is, that we need to make obvious uh, to make, be able to make a decision about what we should do next. And here's some data from what's happened in the U.S. You can see the top chart, Atlantic haddock production has plummeted in the 1960s. Um, US, U.S. regional um, lumber production has dropped. This is all due to increased harvest, harvesting. Ever since we were kids, we knew this. We knew the onceler cut down the truffle tree because everybody needs its need, right? And they cut the trees down, they cut the trees down until no more trees were left. And we do this over and over and over again. Well, a systems thinker needs to speak for the trees. We need to be a Lorax and point out 
the resource depletion is a non-sustainable practice. Let's move on to the next trap. The inexorable increase in production, ever increasing production, ever dropping prices, not only reduces the resource available, but causes environmental pollution. In this trap, we'll look at, we'll look at pollution. So let's go back to our system dynamics model. As capacity increases, waste generation increases. As waste generation increases, the waste level in the system increases. And as the waste level in the system increases, capacity should go down. But you'll notice that's a very, very light line between waste level and capacity. The problem here is it's a missing signal. We don't see it or we ignore it. The system can purify itself. You see as purification rate goes up, the waste level can go down. The problem is it doesn't go down fast enough. We have lots of examples in agriculture of waste that's produced by the system. Pesticides that are showing up in food, phosphate fertilizers and surface waters that cause algal blooms, and manure spills from hog facilities. There's just a few of these environmental pollution problems that we're simply ignoring. We don't look at it. We need a Lorax to point these out and say, hey, that's not okay. Returning to our system dynamics model, we can take a look, look at what's happening here. Once again, capacity increases, increase, increase capacity, increases product, generation of waste, uh, increase generation of waste, increases the waste level, the purification rate is not fast enough to clear it up, and so we've got to increase in waste, things like phosphate fertilizer. Um, the problem is that this often happens someplace else, downstream, away from where the production happens. Let's look at an example. The dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico is an example of waste that's accumulating in one place that was generated someplace else. What happens here is there's soil loss along with fertilizer in the American Midwest. The soil loss runs downstream, runs down the Mississippi and dumps into the Gulf of Mexico. All that nitrate and phosphate fertilizers dumping into the Gulf cause a huge increase in algal blooms. And as the algae grow through the summertime and create great big blooms, they'll eventually die in the wintertime as it gets cold. And the dying of the algae ties up oxygen in the water. This so-called hypoxic zone is huge. It's about the size of New Jersey, we're, we're told. And it's caused by fertilizer loss someplace else. So the increase in production in the American Midwest in corn and soy is causing the problem. But the areas that are producing the problem uh, don't see the effect. The effect happens somewhere downstream. Using our systems dynamics model again, we see one, what first thing that happens is we increase capacity of corn. Two, waste generation of soil and fertilizer in the Mississippi River increases. Three, the waste level of nitrogen fertilizer increases in the Gulf. And four, there's a decreased capacity of fishing in the Gulf that happens far away from the problem. And the solution, the solution is to point out the missing feedback loop. As waste level increases, the Lorax has got to stand up and say, hey, that's not okay. As waste level is increasing, capacity someplace else of some other product is decreasing. We need to point out these problems using systems thinking. Okay, let's move on to the third trap, the community decline trap. Once again, using our systems dynamic model, we see that as capacity increases, total production increases, dropping price, and therefore dropping producer's income. Producer's income drops, there's a, there's a tendency to consolidate, that is farms get bigger. Um, you can either have a neighbor or you can own your neighbor's farm, one or the other, but as with consolidation, we get bigger and bigger farms and fewer and fewer farm families. As consolidation rate increases, the number of producers goes down, moving in the opposite direction. As number of producers go down, the community well-being fact ind indicators go down. That is, uh, health care and education, schools and cultural events in the community are dropping. And theoretically, as community well-being goes down, capacity will move down eventually. Uh, the problem here is that we don't see it and we often don't pay attention. And once again, the story of the community decline. Producers get bigger, they consolidate. There are fewer producers, whether that's farmers or fisher persons or loggers. 
And as people leave these rural communities or fishing villages, the community suffers. There are fewer public services, hospitals, schools, local businesses. The vibrancy of life in these small communities is gone. Now, I said earlier, these, are, these traps are so-called unintended consequences. But in fact, during the Nixon administration, Earl Butts was Secretary of Agriculture, and he made this his intended consequence. He actually wanted to drive people off the landscape. He told everyone to get bigger or get out. And you can see from the chart, as the number of farms decline, the average farm size increases significantly. That wasn't a mistake. That was the plan. So to review, we've got an increase in total production. Let's follow the model around. Production increases, commodity supply increases, supply increases, average price decreases, price decreases, profits per consumer decrease, profits per consumer decreases, a pressure to increase production and get bigger. Size and technology level per producer increases. As the size gets bigger and the technology gets bigger, it increases total production. Let's go down the bottom loop. As production increases, profit increases, and as pro pro profit increases, there's more need, there's more opportunity to reinvest, make for bigger, bigger farms and bigger machines, thus increasing capacity. And around and around it goes, increasing production and dropping prices. The problem is that there are unintended, unintended consequences. Resources deplete, environment is polluted, and communities fall apart. Up till now, I've been relying heavily on the sustainability projects, Hal Hamilton's project um, describing uh, the system. One of my classes, however, came up with a fourth system. Perhaps there are so many people interested in public health in the sustainable food and farming major. Uh, but they identified a, a fourth problem, a fourth system trap. They suggested as commodity supply increases, the number and type of processed foods as compared to fresh foods increases. And as processed foods increase, public health goes down resulting in obesity, cancer, heart disease, and early onset diabetes. The food we eat in this country is generally cheap, processed, and easily available, and not always good for us. Here's the fourth system trap as described in one of my previous classes. As commodity supply increases, the number and type of processed foods increases, moves in the same direction. As processed foods increase, overall public health goes down. As public health goes down, income available for food purchases may also go down. And as you have less money available for food purchases, what happens to commodities? Commodities go up. The increase is increase in demand for cheap processed foods, making this system function in a direction in which public health is always going to be driven down by the commodity system. Well, now that we understand how the system works, we understand some of the traps, the unintended consequences that come along with that system, what do you do about it? Well, let's use systems thinking to try to find out. In this next section, I provide some solutions that were provided by one of my classes as they brainstorm potential solutions given their knowledge of the commodity system. I asked one of my classes to look at the commodity system, try to understand the traps, and propose alternative structures, new things that could be tried, experimented with, in order to address these problems created by the commodity system. Let's start with the environmental pollution trap, an increase in waste production because of increased capacity, and nobody's paying attention. Here are some of the solutions proposed by my class. Increased purification. We know the purification rate increases. We can drop the waste level. Carbon scrubbers, for example, example, on the top of smokestacks that pull the carbon dioxide out of the smoke before it goes in the atmosphere. Reduce pollution. You know, you can cut the pollution directly with best management practices, IPM, and in increase pr improved production product practices, sustainable practices. We could tax pollution. That would certainly put a, put a damper on pollution. We could increase, re reduce the production capacity, actually reduce the amount of uh, products being being produced. Let's take a look at how this might work. Let's use our systems dynamics model to understand these proposed solutions that came up, my students came up with. Starting at the top, 
we might certify non-polluting alternative products and increase sales of non-polluting products, things like organic food. Uh, as organic food production sales increase, profitability of non-organic sales food products will go down. Increasing the non-polluting product will decrease the profitability for the polluting product. And as decreased profits, as, it, as profits decrease, reinvestment goes down and capacity of the polluting products will go down. Down to the next one, the pollution tax. As pollution tax goes up, waste level goes down. If you could indeed in, implement a pollution tax, a tax on the amount of waste product produced, soil running downstream or pesticides on the food, the waste levels would go down. We go down to carbon scrubbers. As carbon, carbon scrubbers are installed on, on smokestacks, purification rate of the smokestacks will go up, move in the same direction, reducing carbon dioxide and reducing waste level. And finally, best management practices. Good sustainable practices uh, can increase, and as good sustainable practices increase, waste generation will move in the opposite direction, direction will decrease. These are all potential ways in which alternative structures might reduce pollution. Here we have some ways to reduce the resource depletion, the using up of limited resources. And our, my students come up with a lot of different uh, proposed examples of how you might increase demand for alternative products or requiring certain production practices like cover crops, increasing efficiency and taxing production to reduce, re reduce capacity. The one that was most interesting, I think, is regulating harvest rate. If you really want to decrease capacity of polluting products, Regulating the harvest rate is one way that might do it. And this seems almost impossible, but this is exactly what's done in the tobacco industry. Tobacco growers got together many, many years ago and created a system where each individual producer could grow a limited amount of tobacco, reducing the harvest rate and reducing the consumption of the resource, in this case, uh, soil and water in, uh, in the American South. Let's look now at community decline and see what my students come up with, suggesting ways to address this fundamental problem. The solution to community decline is more producers, more people on the landscape building vibrant communities. By reducing the opportunities to consolidate and create bigger farms and bigger, bigger companies, bigger fishing boats, um, we can increase community well-being. Number of solutions were proposed, like redefining what a, what a shareholder looks like. You know, when you're looking at profitability, we look at people who have an investment in the system as most of the people who own stocks. But what if the people actually on the landscape were included in decisions? What if you taxed big companies, tax their income uh, at a higher rate than small companies? What if you provided loans and incentives for small companies, giving them a, a, a the capacity to compete with the large companies. The top right, you might support public farms, homegrown food, and local foods, which is something that we do, trying to increase demand for small farm production. At the bottom right, we've got subsidizing small farms, breaking up the land in Cuba after the communists left. They actually broke up the large farms and gave it back to small people. And things like Berkshire's shares are interesting. This is local money that keeps money moving in the local, in the local food system building community, community capacity and community vibrancy. Finally, we look at the forest system trap, the decline in public health that's been caused by so many cheap processed foods. What do we do about that? Back to the systems dynamics model, what do the students propose? Starting at the top and moving around clockwise, you can tax processed foods, increasing their cost and reducing consumption of processed foods. You might subsidize sustainable food production, subsidize local farms and organic farms, help them to become more competitive. You might make food, uh, local foods more available for food producers by doubling their SNAP benefits if they buy at a local farmer's market, something that Massachusetts actually does. Coming around, we might support more CSAs and increase the supply of local foods. We might require that school lunches buy a certain percentage of small farm 
grown local foods. And of course, most important perhaps, we can provide education for what the food, food consumption patterns actually will do to public health. All of these things are potential solutions using the system dynamics model that, that could affect um, the commodity system. So what are we trying to do here? We're trying to change structures to make them more sustainable. As sustainable structures increase, sustainable patterns of behavior will move in the same direction, will increase. And more sustainable patterns will produce more sustainable structures. We really want to create structures that affect behavior. We would really like to affect this model, this reinforcing feedback loop, at the level of structures, because structures will last. How do we do that? Remembering the iceberg model, we know that structures are represented by physical things such as farmers markets, uh, organizations such as advocacy groups such as like CISA, and policies like USDA organic rules. All these are alternative structures based on a different kind of a mental model than the commodity system. But none of these structures are easy to build. In this diagram, we, we talk about um, on the left hand side of the diagram, the ease of implementation goes from easier up to harder. The more difficult things to implement are at the top of the, of the page. On the bottom, the influence on the core drivers of the commodity system move from less to more. So on, on the right hand side, you have more impact. So things like environmental payments and social payments, local marketing, certification like certification organic are relatively easy and less effective. The things that are really difficult to do are also more effective like harvest agreements and limiting technology, supply agreements in which production, production supplies are reduced. These things are really difficult to do. These are the kind of structures we need to create, create long-term systemic change. And how do you create those, those structural changes? Well, they're difficult. We begin with small sustainable actions, starting things like small farms and markets and buying local food ourselves. And those small changes, those small actions will begin to shift mental models. As mental models are understanding of the world shifts, actions will increase, patterns will increase, which means more people will be doing the local, local marketing, and that will, be, will create opportunities for changing structures. We begin by, by small actions and shifting uh, how we think about the world. All we gotta do is change the way we think. And of course, changing the way we think is the most difficult change of all. But I believe mental models are shifting to more sustainable patterns. I have a lot of hope this is, this is changing. There's lots of evidence if you look for the changes that are happening. The food commons is an example of an idea that would allow us to decentralize the food production system and still manage it well. The New England Food Vision suggests that we should be growing 50% of our food locally within New England by 2060. And Blessed Unrest is an example of lots of changes that are happening globally. I'm gonna put, put a short video up on uh, Blessed Unrest It is my belief that we are part of a movement that is greater and deeper and broader than we ourselves know or can know. It flies under the radar of the media by and large. It is nonviolent. It is grassroots. It has no cluster bombs, no armies, and no helicopters. It has no central ideology. A male vertebrate is not in charge. This unnamed movement, you can clap for that. The unnamed movement. <laughs> is the most diverse movement the world has ever seen. The very word movement, I think, is too small to describe it. No one started its worldview. No one is in charge of it. There is no orthodoxy. It is global, classless, unquenchable, and tireless. The shared understanding is arising spontaneously from different economic sectors, cultures, regions, and cohorts. 
It is growing and spreading worldwide, with no exception. It has many roots, but primarily the origins are indigenous culture, the environment, and social justice movements. Those three sectors and their subsectors are intertwining, morphing, enlarging. This is no longer or simply about resources or infractions or injustice. This is fundamentally a civil rights movement, a human rights movement. This is a democracy movement. It is the coming world. What you're seeing here is the beginning of a list of the 130,000 minimum organizations in the world who work towards social and environmental justice. And that's a minimum. It may be 250,000 groups. It may be 500,000 groups. Read these names. They're unfamiliar to you, most of them, I'm sure, right? They are. We do not know how big this movement is. It's marked by kinship and community and symbiosis. It is Pachamama. It's mama, right? It's the earth talking back, waking up, you know? What you see is your kin on that screen, you know? And to give you a sense of how big this movement is, if I had started this tape on Friday morning at 9 a.m. when this conference began, and if we sat here all day Friday, all night Friday, all day Saturday, all night Saturday, all day Sunday, all night tonight and all day Monday, we still would not have seen the names of all the groups in the world who we are. It's so new, we can't recognize it. We're familiar with armies and governments and war and churches and religions, but this is, there's no precedent for what we're doing. What you are creating is completely unknown. It is everywhere. There is no center. There's no one spokesperson. It's in every country and city on earth. It is within every tribe, every race, every culture, and every ethnic group in the world. This is the first time on earth that a powerful non-ideological movement has arisen. And during the span of the 20th century, big ideologies were worshipped like religion. They dominated our beliefs. This is to speed it up so you don't have to stay here until Monday night. But ideologies dominate us. Capitalism, socialism, communism, right? In the words of Ed Hunt, Ideologies stalk the earth clad in armor. Right? They fought for the control of our minds and their lands, and it wasn't pretty. And we were told that salvation would be found in the domination of a single system. This is where salvation will be found. We know that as biologists, we know that as community organizers, we know that as ecologists, it's found in diversity. This movement is humanity's immune response to resist and heal political disease, economic infection, and ecological corruption caused by ideologies. So it is up to us to decide how will we be, who will we be. This is what it is we're building, the capacity to respond. It is about possibilities and solutions. Humankind knows what to do.